Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell. You'll get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And when I'm not asking Bruce, hey, how big was Batista's? Well, you know. One of the things I like to do is help people save money. And if you're watching this video right now and you're in a 30 year loan, man, you're overpaying your single biggest bill and you may not even realize it. I want you to do a little experiment for me. Take your calculator out, multiply your monthly house payment by 360 payments. That's how many payments there are in a 30 year loan. That big scary number, that's your total of payments. You're looking at that number? You know you can do better. Keep more of your own money right now and go to savewithconrad.com. Or maybe you've got credit card debt. Man, it's not a matter of if I can save you money with that. Your average interest rate on a credit card is more than 20%. And by the way, all the interest you pay on those credit cards, it's not tax deductible. Whereas the mortgage interest, well, that is tax deductible. So if you owe this debt, it's up to you how to pay it back. Doesn't it make sense to get the cheapest rate possible and the greatest tax deduction possible? Find out how much money you can save right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com. You don't need perfect credit, even scores in the 500s can be approved, and it's no cost out of pocket. But maybe best of all, we're licensed in more than 40 states. We can help more families than ever before. But how much can we save you? Find out right now for free with a quick quote from SaveWithConrad.com. Hey, this is Kurt Angle, and welcome to the Kurt Angle Show. We have an excellent show planned for you today. We'll be covering the death of my friend, mentor, and coach, Dave Schultz, and the impact he had on my amateur wrestling career. We will also be covering Team Foxcatcher. But first, I would like to introduce to all of you my co-host. You know him as the mortgage maestro, Conrad Thompson. How you doing, Conrad? <laughs> I'm good, dude. I'm excited to be here with you. I have... Uh really wanted to sort of pick your brain about this topic because I'm always interested in folks sort of origin stories and nearly as successful had you not met uh, David along the way, right? Oh, without a doubt. Dave had a lot to do with my success in my amateur wrestling career. I, I met him back in, geez, 1988. I think I was a freshman in college. I just won the ESPA national championships. That's the under 20 years of age national championships. You have to be a teenager to compete in it. So we were, I qualified for the ESPA world championships. We had a training camp at Northwestern university and Dave was one of the celebrity um, technicians and we hit it off right away and we got along very well. He saw something in me that nobody else saw. And because I qualified for the ESPA world team, um, I also qualified to go to the USA wrestling Olympic camps. So I would see Dave there quite a bit and he would work with, you know, on the technique with me and teach me a lot of stuff. He was an incredible instructor. I think a lot of our listeners probably only know of his story from the, uh, you know, the ESPN 30 for 30 or the Netflix documentary or the, the 2014 film about Foxcatcher. And I feel like, more of that was probably focused on DuPont than the David. And I want to, man, let's talk about David a little bit. Tell us about who he was, the man, the person, the wrestler, the, the, the amateur wrestler. And I guess we should also mention, cause we have obviously only wrestling fans listening to this, but primarily pro wrestling. We're not talking about Dr. D the guy who slapped John Stossel. We're talking about the Olympic badass, right? Yes, Dave was an incredible wrestler. He was one of the absolute best of all time. He was a very happily married man, a proud father, great dad to his kids, and a great brother to Mark. He was just uh, an incredible human being that was always positive. He, he never looked at anything from a negative light. He was always positive, and he always wanted to learn. That's the one thing about Dave. He told me this. He said, you can never stop learning. And he didn't. He learned eight different languages uh, from all over the world. So he could learn technique from all the best wrestlers in the world from different countries. That's how complex Dave was. He, he mastered technique and he was the best at it. I want to briefly talk about some of his uh, amateur accomplishments, of course. I think he won the California State Athletic Champion, the California State Championship, like two weight classes higher than his normal division and had what I've read to be the most successful senior year in high school wrestling history in America. What made his high school senior year so special and stand out? 
Well, Dave didn't start wrestling till eighth grade. So he wow. have a lot of experience. He, his senior year in high school, he was only in his fifth year wrestling. And, you know, to dominate two weight classes above and pin everybody in the tournament until the finals, I think he won 12 to one in the finals. That's a hugely dominant, you know, senior year. And not only that, he competed in open tournaments. He would go where NCAA champions were and former Olympians were, and he would beat these guys, even in high school. That's how good he was. He just, and he just kept getting better after that. I've read that uh, he becomes a three-time NCAA All-American, first at Oklahoma State and then twice at the University of Oklahoma. Did you ever talk to JR about David? Was he on his radar? Oh, yeah. JR was a big fan of Dave Schultz. I mean, he did go to Oklahoma, and you know, JR loves Oklahoma. But, um, yeah, JR talked very highly of him. I, I think JR met him uh, once early in the early 90s, and uh, he said that Dave was a great guy. and. He, he was. He was the absolute best. Yeah. How about this for a record? When he's at uh, Oklahoma State University, he's uh, 30 and four. And then at the University of Oklahoma, he's 61 and four. So his collegiate record is 91 and eight. This is like a real life Goldberg, right, Kurt? Oh, without a doubt. He was a Goldberg. He was so dominant. And what made him dominant was he always learned new techniques. And he, he, he used um, his strength was not weightlifting strength. He was really strong, like wiry strength, like old man strength, you know, <laughs> it was crazy because he never lifted weights. And the guy was so damn strong. When I first wrestled him the first time I did, I was 220 pounds and Dave was about 168. So I weighed about 50 pounds heavier than him. And he beat the crap out of me. It's in technique and, you know, um, uh, leverage. He's very good at leverage. That's what made him so strong. But uh, he would grab your arm and you feel like he was going to rip it off. If he clinched you in a gut wrench, you were he was going to knock the wind out of you. He was just the strongest guy I've ever uh, wrestled, especially at that weight class. Are you paying attention to uh, what's happening on the national stage? I know you're like uh... – in 87, I think you were a senior winning state wrestling championships yourself, but he won a world championship internationally in 83. He wins a, a, a gold medal in 84 in the Olympics. Are you keeping up with all of that as a young man? Yes, I was wrestling at the time. I was, uh, I think I was in eighth grade and Dave and Mark Schultz were my idols. They were the guys that I started watching film and wanting to be portray them exactly like them. Them and the Bannock brothers, Bruce Baumgartner, uh, Randy Lewis, there are a lot of great uh, athletes on that Olympic team. And they, it was the most successful Olympic team we had. Of course, it wasn't a fully contested Olympics. You know, some countries didn't participate that year, but it was the most dominant year we've ever had. And the Schultz brothers were number one on my list as my idols. Again, I don't, I don't know nearly enough about their story. I only know what I've seen in the movie and all that stuff, but it almost feels as if they present the story as if there was some maybe competitive friction between the brothers, David and Mark. Would you agree with that? Nothing that brothers don't normally do. I mean, they would bicker and argue, but it wouldn't be over anything big, but you know, they were brothers and they, they competed, you know, trained together and, you know, they were together all the time. But I think that the documentary painted a picture that they wanted to show more drama between the two. But no, Dave absolutely loved Mark, and he always took care of him. And uh, they were very close. There was no problem between the two. When did you first meet these guys in real life? I met Dave. Uh, that was at the training camp. Uh, but I met Mark. Um, I believe it was a Hall of Fame induction. National Wrestling Hall of Fame. And I feel strongly that saving money is important. You know, if it's not something we worry about now, boy, we are really going to worry about it later. And I want to help you get out of debt faster and do it with cheaper monthly payments. I'm talking to you if you're in a 30 year loan. Now is the time to take years off of your loan. We're routinely helping our listeners cut five, 10, even 15 years off their loan. 
And you can do this without perfect credit with no money out of pocket. You've just got to start at SaveWithConrad.com. It was the first time I met him and I, you know, a lot of people thought I looked like him. So yeah. You know, first thing I said to him was, Hey, I'm your twin Mark. <laughs> He's like, who the hell are you? <laughs> but, uh, I got to meet him at a hall of fame uh, when I got inducted. And, uh, it was a, a very special treat for me because I, he was the one more than Dave at the time that Mark was the guy that I was trying to portray. I studied a lot of film of him. And I love this technique and, and his athleticism. He was just, uh, he, he, he was a gymnast for a while before he started wrestling. And that attributed to his wrestling career. He was a phenomenal athlete. He was a much better athlete than Dave. Dave was a much better technician. What did, um, when you first become friendly with the Schultz family, what are they telling you about what their training regimen is like their routine is like i mean obviously if you're trying to sort of move up and you want to progress do you want to know hey what did the greats before me do so now that you have access and you're developing a relationship are, are is he sort of mentoring you on uh do more of this do less of that how does he sort of bring you under your under his wing if that makes sense well dave allowed me to do whatever i wanted to do he he didn't really push me as far as training he just taught me a lot of good techniques and and, uh, you know, told me some ideas he had of training of what I could do to better my technique and better my performance. But Dave wasn't like a, a trainer that he was like, come on, you know, one more. He was, he was more of a teacher. And uh, that, that's how I looked at him. Talk to me a little bit about um, when you guys start to advance into, hey, we're going to we're going to do this full time. We're going to become a team because I feel like sometimes we uh, who aren't in the amateur wrestling community, we don't understand like what that requirement looks like as from a time and effort and focus standpoint in order to get to that world-class Olympic level. It's not like you can just go have, you know, for lack of a better word, a normal civilian life. You're working a job and you come home to the family and, it is a one track focus, right? Oh, without a doubt. You're, you're thinking, you're training, you're doing wrestling 24 seven and, uh, everything that you do has to, uh, help benefit that sport. So when I woke up in the morning, I trained all day until the evening and I would, I would do about nine to 10 hours of total training. It would have to, a lot to do with conditioning, weight training, plyometrics, uh, working on technique, drilling, live wrestling, uh, the whole ball of wax. And, uh, you know, you, you had to do that every day. Uh, you very seldom did you take a day off. It was a very uh, dedicated regimen. If you wanted to be an Olympian, an Olympic gold medalist, this is the kind of stuff you had to do. I do want to, uh, I guess we have to address what was sort of, explicitly said the movie and not but in the spring of 86 a, a wealthy philanthropist and donor makes some efforts to try to reach mark the man of course is john dupont he wants to recruit mark uh and and try to make him a wrestling coach at villanova university and this is where they maybe take some creative liberties with the actual events i guess that just help the movie flow a little better but years before the whole fox catcher thing happens. He's trying, DuPont is trying to put together a wrestling program and it's unsuccessful. And uh, on Christmas Day, DuPont fired Mark like on Christmas Day. This is a weird story. What, when, when do you first hear of this DuPont character? Well, I, I didn't know that John tried to start the club before 1986. I, I thought that Mark joined and Mark was a part of it uh, for a year before Dave joined on. So I'm not sure about the beginning of the club and when John went and started or when he fired Mark. Um, I know that Mark left Team Foxcatcher, and uh, that was, um, I think, in 1988, uh, right after the Olympics. He had a very poor Olympic performance, and it had a lot to do with John. John mm. was all over him. Uh, John was obsessed with Mark. He, 
he didn't want to leave him go. He was always around him, uh, you know, uh, suffocating him, uh, just got on Mark's nerves. And Mark was the kind of guy that you didn't want to get on his nerves. He had a short temper. So, you know, uh, with, with uh, John just trying to be around him all the time and trying to gloat about, hey, I'm with Mark Schultz and, you know, it, it just got really old for Mark and Mark just decided he was done with it. And this is around the time Dave, uh, you know, John DuPont contacted Dave as well to be a coach at Fox Catcher. So uh, Mark left and Dave came in. You know, I, it's weird because it feels like depending on, you know, which piece of media you, you select to hear this story, Mark is not included. In fact, I don't even think he's in the Netflix documentary. Any speculation why they don't discuss the Mark piece of the story at all? I'm not sure who did the documentary. If it was the Schultz family that did it, I'm sure Mark would have been involved in the documentary. I'm not sure if this came from DuPont's side or, or a, a, you know, a production company that uh, you know, didn't contact the Schultz family. They just want to do the documentary. I don't know. But for Mark not to be part of a documentary about his brother, Dave, is really unheard of. I'm not sure why that didn't happen. So uh, apparently DuPont had his sights set not only on Mark, but on, on David too. And David had been coaching, you know, as an assistant coach at the university of Oklahoma, he and even at the university of Wisconsin, Madison, but eventually he goes from just helping with the DuPont program to actually moving to Pennsylvania, uh, to help run a new training center that John DuPont had constructed. And of course, this is the famous box catcher facility. When did you first hear about Foxcatcher and that everybody was going to Pennsylvania? Well, when Dave joined, uh, that was the first time I heard about it. It was, it was in the wrestling newspapers. You know, Team Foxcatcher just started. John DuPont started a club. Dave Schultz is one of the coaches. Uh, it's going to be premier wrestling club. All the best wrestlers in the world will be part of it. And uh, it was a lot of news in the amateur wrestling community. So, uh, John DuPont started a lot of buzz in amateur wrestling. And this was a great opportunity for everyone uh, that could join that club. Uh, the, it would be very, very beneficial on their careers. You know, Kurt, I'm going to veer into a territory here that's a little weird to say out loud, but just humor me. In wrestling, it's not a polite term, but in wrestling these days, well, I guess forever, guys have said, oh, you got to go see so-and-so there's money in them, their heels. That guy's a money Mark. John DuPont was an amateur money Mark, right? Yes. Yes. John, DuPont, I mean, he, he, he wanted to be involved in wrestling, uh, when his mother was still alive, but she wouldn't allow him to. And when hmm. she passed away is when John started the club. So he actually waited for his mother to pass away before he he started, but he wanted to have a club. He was a big mark for amateur wrestling. He was a mark for sports. I mean, John had other clubs. He had a swimming club. He had a pentathlon club, a uh, re wrestling club, uh, state-of-the-art facilities right on the farm where his mansion was. It was incredible. You know, you're from Pennsylvania. So when, when there is a, a an eccentric person like this in the area, it feels like people would talk. Did you ever, do you remember hearing anything about the DuPont family, good or bad, before you actually became acquainted with the Foxcatcher concept? I just knew that the DuPont family uh, was the family that, you know, you know, in, in, or invented gunpowder for the Civil War. They, they supplied <laughs> it. <laughs> so that, that's how the name became really big. And uh, DuPont, you know, DuPont Chemicals, DuPont Foods, uh, you know, there's just so many, it's, it's just a popular name and John's a descendant of that. And, uh, you know, knowing that, you know, that John has a, a great deal of money and, uh, he contributed a lot of that money to wrestling. Yeah. A great deal of money is right. It's estimated at the time he was worth at least $200 million. And, um, here's how variety described the relationship with John and Dave. DuPont was a lonely, socially inept prince desperate to be embraced by his tough, world-class athletes as quote-unquote one of them. 
and Dave sympathetic to the man's strangeness and dependent on him for support for not only himself, but his wife, kids, and the athletes he'd recruited on DuPont's behalf was his favorite, an open-hearted bear of a man who not only embodied the athletic greatness DuPont himself coveted, but humored the wealthy philanthropist's own wrestling dreams, going so far as to coach him in competitions for which, as old videos expose, he was thoroughly unfit. Can you speak to that? Do you think this is a fair assessment of DuPont, that he was lonely and socially inept and really wanted to be one of the boys? I think so. I mean, John didn't have a lot of friends, and uh, I think that you know him reaching out to the amateur wrestling community, to the swimming community, the pentathlon community, it was for him to partake in, you know, communication with other people. John was a loner, you know, he lived on his mansion, in his mansion on his farm and didn't have a lot of contact with a lot of people. And he was very private. And uh, so I could imagine that John was a lonely man and that's probably why he started these clubs. Is it true that they did like this, uh, I guess, a fake tournament where, guys would come in and quote unquote, do the job for John DuPont to feel like he was a accomplished wrestler. Well, I could tell you what I saw. <laughs> this is uh, unbelievable. We were in Bulgaria and uh, you know, John funded the Olympic team in Bulgaria. He actually brought over their very best wrestler to train us. His name was Valentin Jordan. And um, so he was funding the Bulgarian Olympic team for the Olympics that was coming up in 1996. This was 1995. And we had a tournament over there. And, you know, the, in Bulgaria, the, you know, the, the arena was probably 15,000 seats. It was packed. And, uh, you know, we all wrestled in the tournament. And um, John DuPont, at the end, he had a match, a special match. And our coaches went over to the Bulgarian wrestler that he was going to wrestle. Uh, he was a former Olympian. He was retired. And they told him, hey, uh, can you do the job for John? Um, we'll pay you a few thousand dollars. And he agreed to it. And John went out there, and this is after the tournament was over, and the crowd knew that John was funding the Bulgarian Olympic team, so they were behind John. They were cheering him on. So they were, they were cheering for John over their own hometown Bulgarian. And the thing is, John was so horrible – that he would pull the wrestler on top of him and fall to his back and give up points. And the Bulgarian's trying to give up points himself. So the Bulgarian would flip over to his back and John would roll on top of him. And then John would flip onto his back and the Bulgarian would roll on top of him. It wasn't wrestling. It looked like two little kids playing, rolling around the yard. It was, it was just, it was, it was hilarious. And the thing is, the Bulgarian was trying to get John to win and John just kept giving up points and John kept was, was behind on points. And thank God at the end of the match, Bulgarian gave up three points and John won 13 to 12. And the guy worked harder at losing than he did at winning. And, uh, you know, John, they, they, the Bulgarians picked him up in the air, sir, carried him around the arena and the fans went nuts. And it was like, holy shit, I can't believe I just witnessed a, a fixed wrestling match. So the thing is, you know, John DuPont wanted to be like Dave. He wanted to wrestle like Dave. He wanted to act and talk like Dave. He even would teach us technique like Dave. Obviously, he wasn't very good at it. He didn't know what he was talking about. He'd show us something. We were like looking at Dave like, Dave's just like, just let him, let him go. Let him do this. So, you know, Dave was trying to keep John happy. And, uh, you know, John was uh, just wanted to do everything that Dave did. And John was infatuated with Dave Schultz. And I think that was the issue of, of why uh, John ended up killing Dave. Do you think, um, uh, we'll talk about that later. Let, let, let's talk about when you first meet Dave. I, I want to clarify. I think you met him at a camp. Uh, over the summer at Northwestern University. And somewhere in there is when he starts inviting you to Team Foxcatcher. How do you first start coming to the facility? Okay. I, I met him at the camp at Northwestern. And then I was started getting invited to Olympic training camps out in Colorado Springs. And Dave would show up there and we would train together. 
And Dave told me that uh, John DuPont started a wrestling club and uh, he was going to be coaching there. And uh, I thought, wow, this is a great opportunity. I said, uh, do you think that they'd be interested in me? He said, if you win the NCAAs this year, I'm sure they will. And I did. I won the NCAAs that year. And, you know, Dave and John invited me to the farm, Fox Cutcher Farms. And I uh, sat in a meeting uh, in John's uh, trophy room. He had a trophy room with photos of uh, him riding horses and competing in the pentathlon. And uh, he did some um, marathons and stuff. And he had some of the wrestlers up on the wall who won world championships like Dave and Mark. And uh, there was a bear spot on the wall. And John said, that bear spot is going to be you, Kurt. You're going to be a world champion if you join my club. And I bought into it. I bought, I bought it because I, I wanted to train with Dave. And I knew I was going to be a part of the best facility in the world. It was the most innovative facility that was ever built back then. And uh, so... It, all the benefit, it, it benefited only me. You know, there was no reason why I shouldn't join. And uh, at the time I was in college, so I couldn't get paid by Team Foxcatcher until I graduated college. But they were funding my trips to go on international trips and uh, to, to go to tournaments. And, you know, so John DuPont would, would take care of that stuff. And uh, so that that's how it all started. And that's how I got invited onto the farm to join team Fox catcher. You know, even as you're training for the Olympics, you know, off and on all told you're there on the farm for like, what the better part of six years. Yeah. I was there on and off. I didn't stay there full time because I didn't have to, I was in college at the time uh, when I started in the club and uh, you know, training at Clarion was a great situation. I would go up to Edinburgh university, which is only an hour and a half away. That's where Bruce, Baumgartner uh, coached and trained. He was an Olympic gold medalist at heavyweight. University of Pitt had some great wrestlers. I would train there. So I didn't have to go to Foxcatcher. I didn't have to live there the whole time because I was from Pennsylvania. It was a four-hour trip. I could go whenever I wanted. And I usually went once a month for a week, and then I would spend the whole summer there. Uh, but uh, I spent quite a bit at Foxcatcher, and I'd use the techniques I'd learned there and bring them back to Clarion or Edinburgh or Pitt work on those techniques with the other wrestlers you uh you wrote in your book that you never saw anything to make you believe that john dupont was mentally unstable but it was obvious to you that he had substance problems and he wasn't good with personal relationships can you expound on that well i you know john he was very different um john was he he liked to be the center of attention and he was the first year of foster catcher. But when Dave joined, Dave became the center. He became the face in the name of the club. And he was the coach of the club. And John was jealous. John was definitely jealous. He was infatuated with Dave. He wanted to be Dave Schultz. And do I think John had mental illness? Looking back now, yes. Yeah. But back then, we didn't know what mental illness was. It wasn't barely discussed. So we didn't know how to treat it or what to do. Uh, you know, and, you know, there, John DuPont's attorneys tried to, you know, turn around and say we were taking advantage of him. Right. We weren't taking advantage of anybody. John knew what he was doing uh, as far as running the club. We didn't rob him of any money. He'd tell us what we were getting paid, what we had to do, where we had to go. It was, it was just, uh, you know, John was coherent enough to run a club. But, you know, at the same time, you know, he had some issues. He definitely had a, a, a level of mental illness and he took a lot of drugs, a lot of drugs. And all of those things could be contributing factors to why Dave or John did what he did. When you say a lot of drugs, do you mean prescription pills or cocaine or what? Cocaine. <laughs> that was his choice of drug, um, a drug of choice, I should say. Um, you know, one time I was at his house, at his mansion, we just ordered pizza. And I was in his trophy room and he came downstairs and uh, he was sniffing his nose and there was white stuff around his nose and he was trying to rub it off. And he says to me, Kurt, you need to leave. And I said, okay. <laughs> and I, the only reason I left is because he had a gun in his hand. Oh, I was like, holy shit. Like what's going on? 
he said, you, you need to leave. Uh, so I left and he took a wrestler down in his basement. He, there was a, a, a tunnel, a hidden tunnel down there from the civil war when the DuPonts uh, were, you know, producing gunpowder. And there was a, an escape tunnel from the mansion to another house, a guest house. It was about 600 yards long. And John found the cave, the tunnel. So he wanted this wrestler to go in the tunnel. It was only four feet high. So the wrestler had to bend over forward and he had to walk 600 yards and through the tunnel. And John got in behind him with the gun loaded, pointed at him <laughs> 600 yards. And this kid was praying to God, the gun wouldn't go off. So John, there were a lot of incidences of John, you know, doing wacky stuff, but you know, we, nothing ever turned into a murder until Dave was killed. Did you have, when he said, Kurt, you need to leave, did he mean like get in your car and leave the property and go home? Or did you have, you know, uh, I don't know, a bunk somewhere on the property? Oh, we had houses. There were about 30 houses on the farm and we were all placed in different houses. So uh, th th when he meant leave, he meant go back to your house. I got you. I was just there, just there for dinner, having pizza with John and another wrestler. His name was Rob. And uh, th that's when the incident occurred. So let me ask when, when you, um, when everyone on the wrestling club, you know, uh, not John DuPont, the actual wrestlers, the team, when they're trying to reconcile his sort of erratic behavior and the way he's mimicking and almost obsessing about Dave. And back then, of course, we didn't know what we know about mental illness and boy, this is maybe controversial, but it's just honest. Did, did how many, I mean, by and large, you guys had to assume he has a crush on him. He likes him, right? Well, I guess, I mean, he definitely was infatuated by Dave and yeah. Mark. But Mark was his first infatuation. And I think, Dave, I think John had his sights on the Schultz brothers probably years before he contacted them. But, you know, John was just uh, an odd dude. And, uh, you know, what, you know, he was infatuated with Dave and Mark and the infatuation just continued. It's, it's pretty crazy to think about how all this got turned around. Um, let's talk about Dave. It's been written that Dave could apparently push you more than anyone, just about anyone else. And I'm sure a lot of that is just because you respected his accomplishments, but you wrote that the guy only weighed 170 pounds, but he was able to just manhandle people multiple weight classes higher than him. And apparently he had a mean streak too. guys would, you know, try to shoot in for takedowns and he would choke guys in a front headlock and then pin them before the referee even noticed they were out. What can you tell us about dirty Dave? If he were a pro wrestler, dirty Dave, yes, he, <laughs> Dave would have been the biggest heel in the business. Uh, <laughs> he, um, he was able to apply pressure points. He learned a lot of that stuff too, from other wrestlers throughout the world. And, uh, you know, he would get someone in a front headlock and he would, uh, you know, put, put his hands both sides on the, you know, the part that cuts off your circulation in your neck. Yeah. And, uh, he would, put him in a hold and lock it in really tight. And he was super strong. Like when I tell you his, his, his grip and his gut wrench strength were incredible. He put a front headlock on you. You're going to, you're going to, you were squealing. You were getting choked out and you were, you were struggling and it wouldn't take long to pass out. And Dave, you know, did that in the Olympics. He, and uh, the, the referees started looking for it because, you know, a lot of the wrestlers from the other parts of the world were complaining to the officials about Dave, you know, doing that. Dave was just a badass. He knew how to apply pressure points and make people pass out. Uh, you know, the, him and his brother were brutal on the mat. They were just very violent, very physical. Uh, you know, if Dave took your arm, he, he you know, he was going to try to break it. I mean, he was just, he was just amazing. Uh, his strength was incredible for his size. And uh, both of the Schultz brothers were incredible wrestlers and they were very physical. Compare him to a guy, you know, that we hear all the time on JR's podcast. I know it's a different era, 
but Danny Hodge supposedly had a grip strength that you wouldn't believe. He could just crack pliers and he could just squeeze an apple and burst it and turn it into apple juice. But it sounds like this sort of raw strength you're talking about, Dave had his own version of that, right? Oh, he was exactly like Danny Hodge. You know, I'm sure that Dave, if he tried to crush an apple, he'd be able to do it. His grip strength was incredible. And uh, his whole body, crazy thing is he never lifted weights. He never was It's unbelievable. And, you know, he never gained or lost weight. He was always, he was always wiry and thin and, you know, not a lot to, not a lot of mass to his body. And he was really hairy. He looked like he was wearing a coat because <laughs> his, yeah. his body hair was just so hairy. And, uh, you know, it, it, but it made him look like a, 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 a lovable bear. That's how Dave looked. You know, he had the beard and, you know, he's bald up top, but. Um, like yeah, a skinny Dutch of... man tail with the body hair though, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. yes yeah. Exactly. Uh, he didn't look like much, but he was a real badass. You also wrote that he had a very unconventional style, that he would create cutting edge moves, something you'd never seen anyone else do, judo tricks that would blow your mind. And he also learned eight different languages in an effort to be the best wrestler in the world. Because if he can hear what their coaches are saying or their instructions, maybe that's an advantage, right? Oh, without a doubt. And Dave also wanted to learn the languages because he wanted to learn technique from the wrestlers. Uh, he, he was always open to that. Yeah, uh, you know, the crazy thing is when we go on international tours, Dave knew just about every language of every country we went, we went to. So it wouldn't be that hard to communicate with the people there because Dave was so well educated with his, you know, learning different languages. But he did it because he wanted to be the best wrestler in the world and he wanted to uh, keep getting knowledge. That, that was his whole concept of, why he did wrestle, why he wrestled. He wanted to gain knowledge of wrestling. Every, every second that he spent uh, training wrestling was about getting smarter and more knowledgeable of wrestling. That's what it was all about today. You had a uh, pretty rough experience over in Russia in 95. And I think Dave was tagging along with you. Can you tell us that story? Yeah, I was, uh, we had a tournament where, you know, I just won the worlds and, uh, they, Russia wanted to have this big uh, dual meet where Russia's number one team would face the world champions all over the world. And I was invited there. So I went there and um, the day before the event, I went to run along the river uh, to do a five mile run just to, you know, loosen up. And uh, a river dog uh, snuck up on me and started barking and growling. And I turned around and it was foaming at the mouth. I knew it had rabies. And I was like, holy shit, I'm going to have to fight this dog off. It wasn't a very big dog. So I'm kicking it and it runs away. So I start running again. And the dog catches up to me, sneaks up on me. And a little bastard bit me on the leg. It took out a big chunk in my shin. Oh my gosh. And I turn around and it's growling and barking and I'm kicking at it, trying to scare it away. It finally goes away. So I go back to the hotel and I see Dave out front. I said, Dave, I just got bit by a dog. I need to go to the hospital. And Dave told the, the Russians there, he was speaking in Russian. He told them that, uh, you know, I got bit by a dog and I need to go to the hospital. And the Russians tell him, if he's not howling by midnight, he'll be okay. <laughs> and I said, Dave, I'm, I'm not taking that advice. I need to go to the hospital. The Russians, if you get bit by a dog, they don't care. I mean, they wow. <laughs> just, just suck it up and, you know, put a Band-Aid on it. So, uh, so I'm on the way to the hospital, and I had a translator with me. And uh, the Russian driver, uh, it was a black Mercedes, a big one. And, uh, you know, the wrestlers in Russia are part of the mafia over there. Oh, I didn't know that. I'm on a highway and going the wrong way on the highway, going 120 miles an hour. It was 200 kilometers per hour we were going. So that's about 120 miles an hour. We're going the wrong way on the highway. He's flashing his high beams at oncoming traffic. And I'm, I'm telling the, the translator, it's not an emergency. He said, well, I think the guy's just pissed off because – he probably has another run he needs to do. So he wants to get to the hospital as quickly as possible. So thank God we didn't die. I get to the hospital. I go in the emergency room and the doctor's sitting behind the desk and she's reading a book. 
And I sit down and I'm waiting a half hour and she's not responding. She looks up at me and shakes her head and goes back to reading the book. And I asked the translator, I said, what's wrong? He said, well, she's pissed off because you're here during her break. Oh my God. This is the emergency room, right? He said, yes. I said, so I'm going to have to wait till she's done. He said, yes. So she'll be another hour and a half. So I had to sit there and wait there for two hours. And uh, when they, when she checked me out, she gave me, um, uh, what's it called? The medicine for uh, uh, the shots for uh, rabies shots. Yeah. Rabies shot. Yeah. 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 So she gives me a rabies shot, but it was from 1968. It was dated oh, back to what? 1968. So these were the old shots and you had to take seven or eight uh, throughout every couple of weeks. You had to take a different shot for like two months. And so I started it there. And once you start the shots, you have to continue on. Obviously in the United States in 1996, uh, we only had one shot for rabies by then. Our, our, our medicine was going a lot quicker than Russia's medicine. So I had to bring those home and have my doctor apply the shots every couple of weeks, but it was a nightmare from hell. That trip was incredible. Did you see a box or something that said 1968 on it? Yes. On the box, it had the date. <laughs> it was the date of when it was uh, manufactured. <laughs> this is unknown within a year of you winning the Olympics. It's unbelievable. It's crazy, huh? <laughs> I thought when you were trying to think of the name of the shot, you were going to say penicillin. And I'm like, well, I guess maybe that makes sense. But a rabies shot, I didn't even think of that. But yeah, you got to worry about that. Yeah, well, I knew the dog had rabies. It was, you know, his eyes were red, dark red and foaming at the mouth. I just knew it, it was so dirty. This dog was completely, you know, you could tell uh, all it did was, uh, you know, uh, eat a bunch of uh, dead animals along the river. That's all this dog did. Wow. So I knew it had rabies. In chapter seven of your book, you wrote that you had made some uh, phone calls dozens of times. It's January 96. You wanted to call Dave Schultz to tell him you'd be coming to work out at Team Foxcatcher the very next day. You left him a message. And when you came home from training that night, you turn on the TV and on CNN and you see the news. The news anchors telling the story John DuPont had shot Dave Schultz seemingly without reason. And you wrote that it was shocking, but at the same time, in a weird way, it wasn't. What can you tell us about this unbelievable twist? Well, John, you know, he always did some crazy stuff, you know, and we always thought it was for attention. We didn't think it was anything else. It was the fact that he loved Dave. He was infatuated by Dave and he, he was, he was vying for attention. He was trying to, grab the attention away from Dave. It was shocking because, you know, John never attempted to kill anybody before. I mean, he did some crazy stuff, but nothing too crazy. Not, not to the point where we thought he was threatening someone's life, but you know, John would do crazy stuff just for attention. I think that's all, all it was for. We didn't know that he would uh, go to that length and kill Dave. Had you ever had, discussions with dave about the fact that john would snort cocaine and carry a pistol around did he think it was hey he's weird he's eccentric but he's harmless is that always where it came back to or was there a a threat of violence like man i don't know this could get weird or dangerous it was more guess what he did today yeah you know like joking you know he today he, this is he got a tank bought a tank and rode it on his farm and started uh, running over all his barns and buildings on his farm, you know, it, or he would, uh, the, the, the president of FILA was visiting Foxcatcher. He's the president of the world governing body of amateur wrestling. This guy's very powerful. He's a big name. And John DuPont put him in his car and drove him down a hill and went straight into a lake. And he, the, the guy would have died if John, John was an excellent swimmer. So John got him out of the car and brought him back to the shore. But, um, you know, the, the, the president of FILA was really pissed when he came, went into our facility. And it was like, John's doing this crazy stuff again. You know, just, uh, we just thought he was doing it for attention. We didn't know that he was mentally ill or, you know, that he was crazy. We, we, we really didn't know that because, 
we knew nothing about mental illness back in the mid nineties. Right. I mean, you were either crazy or you weren't. And, uh, you know, it was, it was cut, cut dry, but cut and dry, but you know, John definitely had some form of mental illness. You know, I'm fascinated by the story you just told. He's going to bring the head of amateur wrestling, the governing body of wrestling. And it's a big honor to have that guy come to your facility. I mean, it's got to be something where everybody's getting ready. Okay. Let's make sure the facility's clean and everybody have your best shit on and all that type of stuff. And instead we drive the dude in the lake. Do you <laughs> think he did that just because he wanted to position himself as, Oh, I saved this guy's life. Maybe he wanted to have a hero moment. I think perhaps, because like I said, he did a lot of stuff for attention. Yeah, Dave, Dave was getting most of the attention. As a matter of fact, the world governing body of FILA, the president, when he walked in our facility, he walked up to Dave first before John. Mm. So, I mean, I, I know that that really hurt John's feelings. And, you know, I, I think John just had a certain jealousy because he wished he was Dave. He, he couldn't be. So he was doing everything he could to say, here I am. Look at me, you know. Don't look at Dave. I'm here. I'm, I'm, I'm the, you know, the head of the club and I'm running it, not Dave. So, uh, I think that that had, that had a lot to do with their relationship was very close and Dave knew how to calm John down and, and control him. Uh, but you know, the day of his death, you know, was just too late. You know, it's, it's funny that you say, you know, even just the introduction, that he, that he wasn't first bothered him. I kept thinking as you're describing this story these days on social media, people call it clout, Kurt. I don't know that you're in the loop on that, but it feels as if DuPont felt like, or hoped the clout that Dave had in the wrestling community. Of course, Dave had earned it through blood, sweat and tears of competition. And maybe DuPont thought I can't do that. Maybe I can write a check and and buy the clout that Dave has. And that proved to not be as easy as it was. You're right. And John got a lot of credibility by starting the wrestling club. And, you know, uh, he got a lot of respect from a lot of people, but it wasn't the respect that Dave earned. And I think John was trying to make up for that. He wanted to be Dave and he wanted to have the same respect Dave had. And unfortunately he didn't. There were a lot of wrestlers that feared John because they didn't want to get fired by him. You know, they were, he was our boss, but you know, as far as respect, you know, Dave had the utmost respect out of everybody. Is it true? I saw in my research that DuPont didn't do this. I'm going to drive my car in the lake stunt once he did it twice in four days. I heard I wasn't there the other time, but I was told that he did it twice. The second time was with the world governing body of FEMA president. And, and I, I want to circle back to something you just sort of glossed over because it feels like uh, a make-believe story. I certainly believe you, but I'm saying this is the craziest thing I've ever heard. The dude had a tank and ran over his own shit. Yes. Yes. Hey, thank God he didn't use the gun on the tank. <laughs> he, he would have blew up his mansion. It's unbelievable. Yeah, he, he just, he, he, he bought a tank. And I'm not sure where he got it. Uh, obviously, he has a lot of contacts. He could probably get whatever he wanted. And uh, he rode it on his farm and was uh, knocking over buildings and barns and, you know, just trying to destroy whatever he could. He just uh, felt like doing it that day. He was like, I'm June John DuPont. And this, this is what I'm going to do today to kill time. And uh, I think he just had a lot of time on his hands and he had a lot of money. And he didn't know what to do with either one of them. Was, would you, would you categorize John as paranoid? Yes, he was definitely paranoid. And I think the drugs had a lot to do with that. Yeah. Cause like I said, when he was sniffed that Coke and came downstairs, he got really paranoid. You got to leave, man. Um, you know, I'm, uh, I, I found something downstairs. You're going to have to leave. And you know, he was, he thought that, you know, he wanted the wrestler to go in that tunnel, that 600 yard tunnel, because he thought somebody was coming after him. So he was delusional to a point. And I think the drugs had a lot to do with it. Was there any pressure, you know, we'll call it peer pressure, but I guess that's not really the right term here, but I know you guys are all elite athletes training there. 
but if, if he wants to be like you guys, he might want you to be like him. Is he ever pressuring guys to do cocaine? As far as you recall? No, John did that in his own privacy. He didn't want anybody to know about it. I see. I, 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 I'd imagine he had uh, some problems in the past. He also had some problems with alcohol and uh, I'm sure that he was trying to hide both of those. If he was still drinking, I, I didn't think he was still drinking, but I think he switched the drugs to cocaine. And uh, I'm sure that, um, uh, that, you know, that had a lot to do with it. Allegedly, four days before the murder, John fell down in his house and manages to knock himself out. But when he comes to, he has reportedly convinced himself that one of his wrestlers had hit him in the back of the head with a bat. And he goes looking for the wrestler threatening various guys and even throwing some off the farm. Did you hear of this temper tantrum after the fact? Yes. Uh, John, uh, I wasn't there at the time, but John, uh, when he, he was, you know, when he would take drugs, he, he was imagining people were in his walls and, uh, he thought that people were spying on him. And, uh, you know, the incident that you just said, he, uh, you know, he was always paranoid and, so yeah, J John was uh, very paranoid. And when that occurred, I wasn't there at the time, but he went over to the Fox catcher facility and he brought a machine gun with him and uh, he jacked up a wrestler named Dave, Dan Chade, the guy wrestling the Olympic trials finals. And he pointed a gun at him. He said, get the hell off my farm. You, you knocked me out. And Dan was like, I don't know what you're talking about. He said, I want you to get off my farm right now. And uh, Dan left immediately. He left. He actually sued John about it. He didn't win the lawsuit, but he did sue him over uh, scaring him to go off the farm. Uh, but th that was four days before Dave. So John was definitely starting to get more dangerous and uh, scarier. Something else I want to ask about specifically is, supposedly when one of the times you were on the farm, he was saying that, boy, this is stupid, but this is what was said. People were haunting him from inside the walls. And he even said, Hey, Kurt, get out from behind that wall. I'm going to shoot it. Yes. Uh, one of the wrestlers were there. It was, uh, Trevor Lewis and he, um, he, he was, uh, walking with John in the house and John kept looking at the walls and he, he thought somebody was behind the walls and he kept telling Trevor to, you know, uh, they, they would open up, they would knock down part of the wall and look behind it. And, you know, and, and he's like, Hey, Kurt, I know you're here. I know you're behind my wall. And, uh, I wasn't even there. I was, I was back in Pittsburgh and, uh, you know, I, I, I was thinking after when Dave got killed, I was like, thank God I wasn't there at the time. Cause I, I don't know what John would have done. Uh, I'm not sure if he would have killed me because I, he didn't have the passion for me that he had for Dave, but, uh, it was pretty scary. Well, let's, let's talk about the incident. We've talked about the movies and the documentary. They're all out there, but it's January 26th, 1996. And to put this in perspective, guys, we're like six months before Kurt's about to win the Olympics. I mean, this is a crazy story. DuPont drives with his security to Dave's house on the farm. And by this point, DuPont had hired a, a former FBI agent as his personal security because he's paranoid and Dave's outside of his home working on the car and DuPont rolls up, rolls down the window and asks Dave if he has a problem with him. And then he shot him and the FBI agent jumps out of the car and runs off. DuPont shoots Dave a second time. And then Dave's wife, Nancy comes running out of the house. DuPont aims the gun at her and tells her to go back inside as Dave is crawling away shot twice. Now DuPont shoots him in the back a third time. And this time Dave is dead within minutes. This is a real life horror movie that is beyond any story I've ever heard in sports ever. And if you hadn't lived it, I don't know that a lot of us would believe it. What was, uh, what was the talk amongst the, the Schultz family? Did you speak to his wife or Mark or any of the other wrestlers there? What can you tell us about this? Well, I just knew that Dave got shot twice and, uh, John killed him in cold blood. I mean, Dave was on the ground trying to crawl away 
when Nancy came out to the porch and John pointed a gun at her and said, go back in the house. And then he just took the gun and shot Dave in the back one more time. And it's crazy because the FBI agent could have helped. Yeah. He, he took off. Like, you know, he, uh, the second John shot the first time, the FBI agent was scared to death. He just took off and went and ran to the woods. Uh, but John just killed Dave in cold blood. It was, uh, uh, it was really sad. It was uh, mind-blowing. Uh, we, we never thought that he would ever do something like this. But, you know, like I said, you look at some of the patterns that he did, and you look back now and you say, oh, we should have seen this coming. We definitely should have seen it coming. But when you're, when you're in the moment, you don't know. And uh, John seemed to be harmless. So it was, it was a really tough situation. And, you know, my heart went out to the Schultz family because, uh, you know, Dave was truly loved by all of them. You wrote in your book, even with all that money, he was never happy with his life. His parents expected a lot out of him and he didn't deal with that well. And he even wrote as much as I hate him for what he did. I felt bad for him in some ways. This has got to be, I don't know, man, just a worst case scenario for you. I mean, this is your mentor who helps put you in touch with the Fox catcher opportunity. And DuPont was always supportive of yours and helping cover travel expenses and other things. But my gosh, now a real life tragedy has happened and you're supposed to be focused on the biggest accomplishment of your life. Just a few months after this. Yeah, this was a little speed bump in, uh, in my journey to the Olympics. And it, it was tough. I mean, uh, knowing Dave wasn't going to be there anymore and knowing that the club, uh, you know, I didn't want any part of the club anymore. I didn't want the blood money. Uh, so I quit the club right away before anyone ever tried to contact me. I was the first one to clip, quit the club. And Nancy Schultz found out. And she called me and said, hey, I'm starting the Dave Schultz Wrestling Club. I'd like you to be the first member. And I said, all right, I'll do it, Nancy. And she said, well, what were you getting paid at Foxcatcher? I was like, wait a minute, you're going to pay me? She said, yeah. I said, well, I made this much. And she said, well, that's what we're giving you. I said, Nancy, you don't have to do that. I'll just wrestle for Dave Schultz Wrestling Club. That's fine. And she said, no, I want to make sure you get paid what you were getting paid at Foxcatcher what you did was first class and I really appreciate you doing that. Uh, so, you know, it was, it was a really nice conversation with Nancy uh, because, you know, I was going to be her first member of her club and it, it was the first time that I talked to her since the death of Dave. When was the last time? Do you still keep in touch with Nancy? Yeah, we, we talk every once in a while, probably once or twice a year. We text each other here and there. Uh, I talk to her son, Xander. Uh, they le I live out in California. She went on with her life. She moved on. I believe she got married again. And, uh, the, you know, the, her kids are grown up now, which is crazy. But, you know, time goes by really quickly. What about uh, Dave's brother, Mark? Are you in touch with him or have you ever been? We contact each other through social media every once in a while. I, I've never been close with Mark, but Mark and I have earned each other's respect out of what we've accomplished in wrestling and out of because of Dave, because of how I value Dave and how he valued Dave. And we have that connection because of Dave. I want to tell the rest of the DuPont story. I feel, you know, like it's worth mentioning because it feels, I don't know, unfair after John murders Mr. Schultz, he goes back to his mansion and just holds up for like 60 hours before the cops trick him into coming outside. And there's a lot of controversy around this because, well, the police were handling DuPont like he weren't exactly a murderer. I mean, they had become friends with him. He had let the entire police force train on his farm. So he was friendly with, the, with all these guys. But a typical police standoff doesn't last three days, especially with a single guy like this, who's not exactly Chuck Norris. <laughs> um, what would you think of the way the local police handled this whole situation? I mean, the, the Schultz family had to be furious. Well, the local police, they were very tight with John because John had a firing range on his farm that the police officers would utilize. 
Yeah, so they held John up, but I'm I'm not surprised why they did it because John was dangerous. John knew how to use machine guns. He knew how to use grenades. He had all that stuff in his mansion. And I believe the FBI, even though in the police there, they, they were friends with John. They knew John very well, but they also knew that John knew how to use these weapons. And they didn't want a big, you know, war going on. So uh, they, they wanted the standoff. I'm sure it wouldn't have gone much longer. I'm sure they would have ended up breaking in the house, but uh, they, they were trying to make it a peaceful standoff because they knew John was dangerous. And he was. He knew how to use all that stuff. And uh, he had a lot of it in his house. Well, eventually he's taken into custody. And uh, of course, this thing's going to go to trial. And of course, he's got a ton of cash. So he's going to hire some high powered defense attorneys who are going to try to paint him as uh, sort of the patriarch and donor of this American wrestling team. But he was really being taken advantage of by these young wrestlers because he had shown some interest in the sport. Were you a part of the trial? Do you remember all this? No, I wasn't part of the trial. But it, it pissed me off that the, you know, the attorneys thought we were taking advantage of him. When you take advantage of a guy, you try to rob him of his money. Uh, the guy has no say in what you're going to do to that person. In other words, John told us what we're getting paid. Uh, what we had to do, where we had to go. He was in charge of everything. We couldn't take advantage of him because he was very, uh, very canny about how to run a club. He, he was doing it with the swim club and the pentathlon club. So he, he had experience doing this. We weren't taking advantage of him. Now, we might have taken advantage of the fact that he was mentally ill, but we didn't know it at the time. We just thought he was doing it for attention because, uh, you know, that's John always wanted attention. That, right. That's that, that was him. He, he always, the reason he even started a club was for attention. So he was, he was a lonely old guy that wanted to have uh, some form of attention and that that's how he was going to get it. Ultimately he pleads insanity. The defense is eventually, uh, thrown out of court and on February 25th, 1997, He's found guilty of third degree murder, but it's not your typical guilty victory. It's uh, guilty, but mentally ill as a verdict. And the judge sentences him to 13 to 30 years incarceration. He's going to be housed in a minimum security facility in Pennsylvania. And uh, he was first eligible for parole on January uh, 29th, 2009, but he wasn't granted it. And of course, uh, the next year he passed away in December, 2010 of COPD. And boy, this is weird. According to his will, he wanted to be, and I guess was buried in his red Fox catcher wrestling singlet. What a strange story, Kurt. It is strange. And you know, uh, John was just a, an odd figure who, you know, the way he went about things, he was very eccentric, no doubt about that. He definitely was mentally ill. We just didn't know it at the time. And, uh, you know, he just, he always, he was always taking drugs. So, you know, we don't know what clouded his decisions or what made him do what he did. We don't know if he was just playing crazy, if it was the drugs, or if it was the animosity toward Dave. We don't really know what it was, but it was, it was a really... Uh, you know, depressing situation, especially uh, six months before the Olympics. Let's talk about the Olympics, but first I want to mention if there is a bright spot uh, in any of this story, because there's not many, um, allegedly anonymous sources tell the Philadelphia Inquirer that John DuPont paid at least $35 million to Nancy Schultz and her family as part of a settlement. So Listen, there's no replacing a husband and a father and a dad and a partner and a coach and a mentor, but it's nice to know that, you know, Nancy doesn't have to now say, oh God, what now? Right. Yes. Uh, the, 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 the deal, you know, the situation they got, uh, with the money, the 35 million, uh, that's not going to replace Dave, but oh. Nancy didn't have to worry about what she had to do the rest of her life. Yes. She knew her, her and her kids would be taken care of. So, you know, 
if anything good came out of it, that was the only good. thing. Yeah. I mean, and, and it's weird to even say that, but it is like, you know, it, that's one less thing they have to worry about. Right. Let's talk about the Olympics and we're going to do a whole episode on that, of course, because we're right here at the 25 year anniversary. So uh, we don't want to talk all about the Olympics now, but a, a few months after this, man, you're going to be in the biggest stage of them all and accomplish all of your goals here. And you hold a big press conference afterwards. And of course that's natural. That always happens, but you see Nancy in the crowd crying and you say to the crowd quote, Nancy, I just want you to know Dave had the greatest impact in the world on me. That one was for Dave too. I want to thank you for everything you did for me. And I especially want to thank your husband for helping me win the gold medal. This is the bright spot in the story that he may be gone, but his legacy lives on through your Olympic victory, right? Yes. I couldn't have done it without Dave or Nancy. I mean, th those two are the most giving people in the world. What Dave did for me, for my wrestling career and how Nancy was able to uh, continue to pay me while I competed uh, during the Olympic trials and the Olympics. Um, those two are the most giving people I've ever met. And I I'm indebted for the rest of my life to them. Let's uh, bring the focus back to David Schultz for a minute. When he died, David was only 36 years old. Uh, he was maybe past his elite prime from the eighties, but he's still trying to make the Olympics one last time. And he was great. So great that he was ranked number one in the USA in his weight class in 95. How do you think the Olympics would have shaken out had Dave been a part of them? Well, if Dave would have continued to be number one in 1996, as he was in 1995, he made the world team that year. And in 1996, he was ranked number one, but we still had the Olympic trials. If he would have won the trials, he definitely would have medaled. There's no doubt about that. Uh, that's our best weight class. Uh, it's our most competitive weight class is the 163 pound weight class right around that position or that, that, that weight category. And, uh, Dave, whether it was Dave or Kenny Monday or who, whoever it was going to be, they were going to medal. So Dave, Dave was definitely one of the favorites. And if he would have made the team, he definitely would have medaled. To tell our, our just pro wrestling fans who are listening, how important Mr. Schultz was to you, almost all of your gear was an homage to Dave Schultz. Can you explain that? Yes, my rookie year, I wore Dave Schultz's singlet, the, the one that they uh, attributed to Dave after his death. It's the one he wore in the 1995 World Championships. It's the, the red, red and blue singlet with the American flag on the front. I wore it my rookie year, and that, that's the same singlet that, that Dave, uh, that they made in remembrance of Dave. So I did that uh, in memory of Dave. Let's jump to some questions. We got a, a ton here. Uh, Roger wants to know, Kurt, did you see the film, and what did you think of it? I thought the film was good. I thought it was really accurate, except for the innuendo that Mark might have been gay. Uh, with John, that was just a little far fetched. Yeah, uh, and, and they did some things to build up drama. Uh, another thing was uh, uh, John Dupont's mother was not alive when Foxcatcher started, so uh, those two things are the only things. Uh, but other than that, it was pretty accurate. Umar wants to know if Dave was alive when you decided to pursue a career in professional wrestling, what would he have said about it? Actually, Dave, he's a free spirit. He would have said, go get it, man. Make that money. That, that's Dave. Dave would have been 100% uh, supportive of it, definitely. That's the kind of guy he is. He just, he's a California boy. You know, he, he goes with the wind. And, uh, you know, he's, he's just, uh, I never seen him have an argument with anybody. He's the nicest guy in the world. He would have said, go do it. A wrestling historian wants to know what was the best lesson Dave taught you that you can never learn enough that uh, learning is never finished, not until the day you die. And I'm sure that Dave, that's the way Dave led his life. I'm sure he learned something new right before his death because he was always learning. And, uh, I, I took his advice, you know, uh, the, the, the only way you learn is by listening. And, uh, you know, you, you talking all the time, you're not going to learn anything, right? You listening to somebody, 
and taking their advice. That's how you learn. And that's what Dave taught me. Uh, Christian says you've explained in an interview that whenever a tragedy happened to you, you would use that pain to fuel yourself into working harder. Do you think that every highlight of your career is a result from that? Or is it just a coincidence? No, I think it's a result of it. Um, I've always been able to uh, deal with controversy and uh, pain. Uh, I think uh, the reason is I try to shut it out and I try to keep myself busy by doing the task at hand, which for most of my life has been competing and performing. So, you know, it's one of those things where I, I just have to, uh, you know, stay focused on it and, and, and do what I do best. And that's what I do. J.M. Wagner wants to know any memories of Kenny Monday. He wrestled at Dave's weight and won gold in 88, four years after Dave and silver in 80 in 92. Kenny Monday was one of the best wrestlers in the history of American wrestling too. He's up there with Dave and they were both competing for the same spot. They actually uh, rotated 1984, 88, 92, uh, back and forth. So um, both of them were exceptional wrestlers and uh, two of the best wrestlers of all time. And uh, Kenny was uh, very special. He had a, a great talent. Uh, he was really quick. Uh, the Russians nicknamed him the Puma uh, because he was like a cat. <laughs> and uh, him and Dave would have been the two favorites. Well, I know what uh, Kenny Monday's favorite snack would be these days if he's looking for protein. And, of course, it's chicken snacks. And, yeah. man, I got to tell you, I'm seeing tweets left and right about this stuff lately, Kurt. I don't know if you've seen what I saw, but – People love the Randy Orton interview. And I think that cinnamon flavor is flying off the shelves. I see your Buffalo wing there. <laughs> it's still your favorite. Yeah. Things are good over in the chicken snacks land, aren't they? Yeah, we're doing pretty well. Uh, thank you to all the listeners for ordering the chicken snacks. Uh, you can get them at physicallyfit.com. Use the promo code anglepod20 and get 20% 20, 20 off your order. Uh, or you can uh, do what Conrad says. <laughs> Yeah, man, go to Amazon.com. You can pick them up there. You can even go find them uh, nearby. If you want some today, I bet there's a store within driving distance. There's three within driving distance of me. You want to know where to go? Go to physicallyfit.com. Click where to order, and you can just type in your zip code, and bam. I've got one that's just two miles from me. But I like saving cash, and you do too. So do this instead. Click order online now, and you don't just have chicken snacks to choose from. You've got plant-based protein as well, right, Kurt? Yes, we have the plant-based protein. It's 100% organic plant protein. So you can do the chicken snacks or the Snack Smart. They're both incredible. We have 11 different flavors. They're awesome. Check it out. You're going to be glad you did. Don't forget to use that promo code ANGLEPOD. You'll save 20% off your entire order, not just one bag, but every order. And I want to mention, too, the list price is $9.99. But, of course, with your 20% off, it's 8 bucks. But there's seven servings a bag, right? You're talking seven different servings, Kurt. Yes. So it's not one serving. So it's it's not that expensive. It's $9.99. That's before the promo code, your coupon off, 20% off. But uh, it has seven servings in it, 10 grams per serving. So it's 70 grams of protein per bag. So you're talking like a little over a dollar for 10 grams of protein. What are you waiting on? Check it out. Physicallyfit.com. Use that promo code ANGLEPOD. And I'm really excited to brag on you. You're still doing something really cool over at KurtAngleBrand.com. You can still get birthday cards, which is the best birthday present you could ever give the wrestling fan in your life. You've got autographed photos, all very affordable, but you got cowboy hats, you got milk cartons, and maybe my favorite thing, people can send you their stuff to get signed by you. So maybe you met Kurt once upon a time, have Kurt sign that photo. Maybe you've got an old world title. Kurt loves that old Big Eagle Championship. If you got a replica, Kurt will sign it for you, right, Kurt? Yes. Yeah, so you uh, give me a small donation for charity, and I will send you back whatever you have me want me to sign. Just uh, go to the address on my website, send it to that address. I will sign it for you, return it for you. All I ask is for a small donation for charity. It's uh, the KurtAngleBrand.com. And don't forget, you can follow us online if you haven't already on Twitter. Uh, it's at the angle pod. And I want to mention too, we've got one heck of a schedule coming up next week is perhaps our most requested topic. It's your street fight with Shane McMahon. 
And I don't want to just talk about the match. I think we should watch the match, Kurt. What's the you? That would be awesome. I haven't seen that match in like 10 years. I would love to watch it and, uh, and uh, commentate over it, uh, you know, let the fans know what I was thinking and what I was feeling at that particular time because that was a really painful match. It's going to be unbelievable. It's hard to believe it's been 20 years since that match happened, and it's coming up next right here on the Kurt Angle Show. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Leave us a five-star review if you think we've earned it, and tell your friends about your favorite new wrestling podcast. It's the Kurt Angle Show right here on Westwood One. We'll see you next week, everybody. Thanks, guys. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And go save yourself some money right now. If you're in a 30-year loan or you have credit card debt, it's not a matter of if I can save you money. It's a matter of how much. Find out right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com.